balls and feet where you at please commence <laughs> welcome back to the footy fetish show where the fetish is real and the footy is soccer i got my balls at my feet ready to rock this with my co-host my partner in crime the future coach of the u.s men's team who that say they're gonna beat ocho where you at hey, hey. back on the mic with the mic daddy mike daddy it's a pleasure to be back on the pod with you how you been Always a pleasure. Uh, just getting, just getting back to normal. Um, had a had a weird little sickness there for a minute. Not COVID, uh, but uh, just uh, <laughs> picking up the slack. Start feeling like myself again. Start rubbing them feet together. Play with my balls. Mm. Start feeling like mm. myself. How I saw you, you uh, sir. I saw you're out there kicking the ball on some on some graph. Got the shoes on. Getting the balls in the net. You know, like I, I just love seeing that stuff, man. I love seeing you get out there and kicking. Th- threw on the vapors, dude. It had been a minute. Ooh. Ooh. Getting vapors. <laughs> so, what's our uh, what's our podcast on today? What's Man, the glad you asked. Today, we gotta do some some Champions League. Like some Champions League. Right? Time. Uh, we need somebody to help break it down for us. I don't think we can do it on our own. We need yeah. somebody. We need somebody who knows this game and loves it. Who you got, Ocho? You got somebody? I think I got somebody hailing all the way from Ghana. Welcome back to the show. One of our favorite guests of all time, Ghana Joey. How you doing, sir? What's up? I'm, I'm good, you. I'm good. Um, how is everybody? Doing well, man. Doing well. So glad to have you back on the show. Uh, yeah. How have you been? It's, it's been a long time as well. Um, but then I'm good. Everything is okay where I'm from. I don't know about Louisiana at the moment. <laughs> I can tell you we're okay. We've been through worse as a city, so right now we're uh, we're doing just fine, and uh, we're yeah. glad that soccer is still going. That's amazing. That's amazing. Excellent. Starting to get hot again. We had some really weird weather there for a minute. Got yeah, super did. cold there for a second. I think I had what happened in Texas. So yeah, I was like, hey man, that was so not cool. No. <laughs> It's right next to us too. We uh, that storm that went through Texas came over to New Orleans. My I lost electricity in my house for a couple of hours. Yeah, uh, it's really cold. <laughs> well, it's actually normal here. Losing lights, not getting electricity for a week. You know, we go through that often sometimes. Really? Yeah. But then wow. let's say for a while now. It's been relatively stable. Um, in the past four years, it's been relatively stable. But then um, I can I can I honestly tell you guys, um, like four years ago, it was hard. And there'll be um, no electricity for like a week or two. And then every, everything is stable now. Wow. Damn. Yeah, but ours was, was down to political issues. Um, um, but then everything has been resolved. So. Okay, that's good. Glad to hear. to hear that. Yeah, that's good to hear. Man, people here, if we didn't have electricity for a week, they'd die. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know when Way I was too reading that in the news, I was actually surprised that people are dying because there is no electricity. <laughs> yeah. They're usually now, not the brightest. Like, man, if, if this thing was supposed to happen here, then I think all of us would not be alive. I don't think I would have been here talking to you guys. Cause, oh, man. man. <laughs> we don't want that, Joe. We no. want you on the show. We want to hear what you got to say about definitely, the champions. Definitely, definitely. That's right. But then from our side of the world, if there is no electricity, people are still fine. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, just before we jump into this, give the people yeah. a heads up out there. Give, give our soldiers a heads up. What time is it over in Ghana right now for you? Um, it's six o'clock p.m. Okay, all right, not yeah. bad. It's it's twelve here, twelve noon here. So, okay, awesome. cool. Yeah. Real That's quick great. before we jump into this episode, uh, Joe, remind everybody what game is about to come on in about two hours. Who's about to play? Um, we have Milan Roma playing in the next two hours man i I just can't wait for that game i'm very Um, excited and something you told me in the whatsapp group was a uh, a certain player will be starting over our captain why don't you tell us about that (laughs) 
Man, I was I was actually telling you um, um, about Purely that he honestly has the the balls to actually drop um, the captain himself. You know, out from the starting eleven, he has been benched, and then tomorrow he's starting the Looney from Chelsea. So that's it has to work out because if it doesn't, hey, all the blame will still be back to Purely. And yes. then I know the Italians are already freaking out, man. Why can you bench the captain, man? So, for those who don't know, the captain of Milan is Romagnoli, and the coach, Pioli, has benched Romagnoli for the Chelsea Loney, Tomori. Uh, and, and I know you just said that, but uh, some of our listeners aren't as familiar with, with European soccer, so I just wanted to make sure we got those details to them. Yeah, uh, I'm excited. Joe, you and I talked about this. Tomori is super fast. I think he will he will make up for his lack of defensive ability with his speed and acceleration and aggression. And it's going to be really interesting to see. Yeah, that's very true. Um, but then I, I was reading an article where somebody was saying um, Milan is actually playing Roma now. Roma doesn't really have any any quick striker at the moment that is going to probably be a worry to Romagnoli. So probably um, Pioli could have still decided to maintain Romagnoli um, just for the Roma game. Then um, subsequently, then probably um, we push Tomori into the setup. But then throwing Tomori just in the game from right from the start in 11, you know, it's a big game. So... If it doesn't work out for him, it means that will be it. Sometimes, you know, certain kind of players, if they don't, if it doesn't work out right in the big games, it can really damp their spirit, and then they may not be able to play afterwards. Yeah, very true, very true. Well, anyway, I'm, I'm excited. Very supportive. I think I think he's good. Playing for Chelsea is a big club already, so I don't think this should actually be a problem. Because he's already playing in the Premier League, right? To get to get a defender from the Premier League to come play in Italy, uh, I think it's a big deal. People don't give him enough credit for what he did at Chelsea, but he came over here and he's immediately impressed all of the Milan fans. I don't think there was anybody that was disappointed in his ability. So it's really good to see the really good to see Pioli give him a chance. And for me, what this says is. They're making a decision to show that no one player is above the club. Everyone, right. everyone, even the captain, has the uh, the chance to sit the bench for the better of the club. And they're, I'm glad they're not playing politics or favorites here. And uh, I think this is a good game for Tamari to step up and show us what he's capable of. Yeah. Should Fantastic. be a fun one, man. Y'all, y'all yeah. been kind of slacking a little bit. So this would be a big win right here. Definitely need it. We, we need these points for sure. Keep up with Inter, who did, who won today as well. So that's right. It's rock. I might, I might give that's that rock. a watch. Hell yeah. Let's give this, let's give this a watch, shall we? Let's get into it. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. I want to get all up in it. Mm. Get so far up in, it, I'm gonna pay rent for a month up in it. Let's do it. <laughs> Our first match we got here on the docket. Atletico Madrid, who is somehow still leading La Liga, don't ask how, against Chelsea, who's starting to catch fire ever since Tuchel came and taken over. This had all the makings of a fun one. Uh, the score might tell you otherwise, depending on who you who you ask. I know Hugh enjoyed this one. Me personally, I wanted Atletico to, to, to take it home, and they didn't. So I didn't have uh, – I, I didn't enjoy it as much. But uh, Dudu Giroud. With probably one of the goals of the tournament so far. If you haven't seen it, go back and check it out. Nice little bicycle kick. Really fun one. Uh, who wants to kick this one off first? Ocho, take it away. Yeah, so this one, this one's great. Um, I saw there was a lot of people giving Simeone uh, some criticism for for dropping six defenders. He uh, he was playing. Uh, a six three one, which is pretty uh, pretty insane. A lot of people were giving him criticism, like why would he do this? But when you think about what Chelsea are doing, they're they're doing the the modern attack where they've got three forwards 
who are both um, surrounded by the left and right back. And when you have a five-man attack with your outside backs, it really gives you an advantage on a four-man back line. So what Simeone did was he said, okay, I'm going to create the numerical advantage. I'm going to have six men against your five, and I'm going to force you to play it outside wide where we've got the numerical advantage. And for the most part, it worked. His play worked. He was able to keep Chelsea from scoring a goal. The one goal Chelsea scored was a phenomenal bicycle kick, and Giroud was actually in an offside position. But fortunately, the Atletico Madrid defender knocked the ball to him and gave him the opportunity to score. If we look at what Simeone did, I'd say that's success. His game plan came out. It worked. And I think Chelsea got lucky here. Granted, they had more of the attack. When we look at the the stats, Chelsea had 63% possession. Atletico had 37. Chelsea had 11 shots to Atletico 6. Um, this, this fell exactly into Simeone's game plan. Sit back, park the bus, and uh, encounter when you can. Suarez also looked really good. Unfortunately, didn't capitalize. One more thing I got to add is that, um, and I, I got two more things. Joao Felix needs to leave Atletico. He is being wasted at, at Atletico. I feel like if he was on a team Dude. like Manchester City, or if he was on a team like um, who's another like a Bayern Munich, I feel like he would excel. Simeone is forcing him into a drop back and defend and counter type of player. Uh, and he's, he's excelling at that, but he's not getting a lot of touches on the ball. And I feel like he's kind of being wasted at Atletico with this park the bus and counter uh, kind of play style. Uh, one more thing I want to point out is we actually saw Shakhtar Donsk do a 6-3-1 or a 6 one 2 one against Real Madrid, and it worked beautifully. Shakhtar actually beat Madrid and tied them both times they implemented this six-man back line and it was because Real Madrid attacked the exact same way Chelsea did five players going forward with your two outside backs being on the on the flanks and it, it works if you can have players to counter it it's going to have success behind it uh, but overall I love this game even though it was 1-0 even though I predicted Atletico to win this game I thought this was a really good tactical battle between a Spanish side that's doing really well and a Chelsea side with a brand new coach in Thomas Tuchel. You know what? Let me uh, piggyback on you for a second there with with what you said about Simeone. And you know, we love to piggyback here on the on the Footy Fetish show. Let me let me, mm. put, let me put my ball in your lap here for a second. Uh, just piggyback on you. So I'm holding it. So hold it real quick. Those same mm-hmm. people that were making fun of Simeone for this for what he did for dropping so many defenders back were praising him for doing the same damn thing when he beat Liverpool. So. Uh, that's point number one. He likes to do it, and I'm going to tell you, I would say seven times out of ten, he's successful with it. And then the few times he's not, he gets bashed for it. And he, you know, there's the rumor, so he might he might get fired. Blah blah. blah. Well, he he seems to have success for it the majority of the time. So I would do the same thing. I'd go with what I know and go with what works. Um, secondly, I like what you said about this being a success. A lot of people forget there's another game. There's still another game. This is not over. Um, I do that myself sometimes, too, with some of these games. Hello? You see the results, yeah. you're like, yeah. God, that was freaking terrible. All that can be erased. The the doo-doo Drew bicycle goal here, that can be forgotten if Atletico mm-hmm. comes back and scores two. Um, so there's still a lot to, to be done here. Um, not to mention this was at Atletico, right? Um, ne- yes, at, the, at Atletico, Nacional Arena. So chance to get your away goals. Chelsea's got one. One goal, one goal next match, we're on even terms completely, and everything that we've seen so far means nothing. So, Correct me if I'm wrong, but if Atletico win 2-1, to one, they advance, right? Yes. Because it's away goals. Yes, because they would have two and Chelsea would have one. So there you go. Of all the teams in Champions League, I feel like Atletico are capable of countering and scoring two goals on two opportunities – with Suarez, Joao Felix, and uh, Angel Correa. Certainly. Uh, not to mention, Llorente was the guy that stepped up against Liverpool. Yeah. And, you know, he, he's capable. He's capable of taking it to the whole field. Um, go ahead. 
I was going to say, uh, a guy like that that pops into my head that you could just see come out of nowhere and possibly take over is uh, Coquet. We've seen him yes. do that many times uh, in La Liga, and he's been with them forever. There's plenty of times where this man's done that. So um, I could see him being being like maybe that X factor that they're missing right now. Uh, Suarez, uh, I've seen better games out of him. Uh, this one didn't really impress me too much, and I think he could turn that around the next the next, uh, next leg. So uh, that's another guy that maybe he could take over. So – We'll see. Uh, it's not over yet. Props to Chelsea for doing what they do, where they just keep at it and score one goal and take the win. But just piggyback one more time what we said. When I, the thing I love about Champions League is those away goals, it's almost like, yeah, sure, Chelsea has the lead right now. But Atletico score one, and Chelsea will constantly be p- playing catch-up because Atletico will be the away team scoring away goals. It's almost like they're going to be playing catch-up should Atletico start scoring. So, uh, with, with that being said, uh, hey, Joe, can you hear us? Yeah, I, hear you. I can. What are your thoughts on the Chelsea Atletico Madrid game? Um, I had you talking about it. I had you talking about John Felix. Um, you saying you feel um, Diago Simone is already using it. Um, a defensive setup, so it's not really helping him at the moment. You feel if it's, he's in the more attacking side, he's going to try, um, which I really agree with you. It was very noticeable in the Chelsea game as well. Um, you still feel, I think we already talked about this during the group stage as well. Um, Atletico Madrid, whatever you expect them to progress, it looks like um, they begin to stumble um, and it's, it's, it's happening unless they can really turn things around in Stamford Bridge, which seems very unlikely, but then um, things doesn't look at the, look good at the moment. They were really poor in the first, in the first leg. I was actually not expecting that results. Um, but then Chelsea actually did well as well. Um, Seeing that spectacular overhead kick from Drew, that was amazing. Yeah, definitely, I agree. Uh, Joe, appreciate that that perspective there. Definitely uh, agree with you. Chelsea did actually play pretty well, despite Simeone dropping a whole bunch of numbers back. Specifically for me, uh, one of the players I really liked for, for Chelsea was Kovacic. He was finding a lot of space. And, uh, and and creating a lot of havoc uh, in between that line of six and that line of three, which was it was giving Atletico a, a run for their money. Not to mention, Giroud was also doing a, a really great job holding the ball off and then laying it off for Kovacic, Kovacic, yeah. um, so that he could find more gaps in the open space. So uh, I, I totally agree with you. Chelsea had a really good game plan. Got to give crop props to uh, Thomas Tuchel here, the German. He, uh, he, We've heard a lot of criticism. He seems to be living up to the hype as the Chelsea manager right now. Who? Thomas Tuchel, the manager for Chelsea. Yeah, yeah, he's been burned. I think it was, it was, it was eight matches on beating prior to the Atletico game. So I think he's been good. Um, and I think all the guys on Chelsea, the lads are really playing it out for them. And you can see all the players are hungry and then they want to be part of the starting eleven. So everybody is working so hard. But then that was never the case for Frankie. Right. Yeah. It, it's a definitely, you can see the mentality is different uh, with this Chelsea team. Going forward, Joe, I want to get your opinion. Do you think Atletico can get two goals uh, at at Stamford Bridge? Um, it's absolutely possible. And then um, with the kind of quality they have at the moment, I think they can um, easily overturn the results. But then um, it's still going to be very difficult looking at the results Chelsea are pulling at the moment. And what, like, just like you said, Tuchel is doing at the moment, he still remains unbitten. So it was going to be pretty hard for Atletico Madrid. But then um, I will still go for Atletico because I feel 
they should have the experience to to at least um, score two or more and, and kick Chelsea out. Agreed. Yeah. Booty, what are your thoughts on the second leg? Do you think Atletico can overturn Chelsea's lead right now? Yeah, certainly. Certainly. And because of what we just mentioned a few moments ago, um, you know, when when you're going to be that away team, the pressure is now on Chelsea, in my opinion, uh, to, to hold this lead. And it's going to be interesting to see how do you go about this if you are Simeone, who does like, you know, tend to kind of play that defensive mindset that we're talking about. Um, if I am him, honestly, I wouldn't change anything yet going into this. You go into it and you see where you're at maybe 30 minutes in, maybe 40 minutes in. And should this maybe still, you know, you still don't have that goal, then maybe then you you crank up the pace a little bit and start throwing players forward. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what he decides to do. He seems to always pull something out in big moments when he really needs it. So we'll see. We'll see. Uh, I also think it's dangerous, though, the fact that you're playing Chelsea. You know, I rag on Chelsea a lot. But the thing I am going to give them credit for is they do they do th- things like this. They go up against somebody they're not supposed to, to beat. They go up against somebody that plays very defensively, and they still manage to get that one goal. Uh, so they always manage to get the results, even though sometimes it doesn't look sexy. But the way that they're playing right now with Tuchel, whole different mindset from Frankie. It seems like he's starting to really figure out who he wants in this lineup, and it seems to be working for him. So I would keep rolling with it uh, if I'm Tuchel. And also, you know, he's, he's bringing that German mindset we always talk about. We Chelsea came out this last match with the three-man back. You could tell he's wanting to score goals here. He's wanting to push people forward. So we'll see. We'll see. But I, I, th- I think they can do it. I think they can pull it off. But I don't think he should ru- – Simeone should rush into it. Agreed. Agreed. I, I really like what you said in that uh, Tuchel's going with a, a three-man back line uh, and pushing forward, going for goals. That's something that uh, I feel like Frankie, he, he didn't make it that obvious that he really wanted to threaten the goal. A little hesitant. Uh, but I, yeah. yeah. yeah I, I really like that point there with the three back line because last time we saw a three back line for Chelsea, Frankie might have done it once or twice, but to do it consistently, the last time we saw it was with Conte. And Conte wound up winning the league. And uh, actually, a uh, fun little fact here, Conte was so successful with a three-man backline, he even motivated Arsene Wenger to try a three-man backline with Arsenal, which he has never done. So uh, really cool to see Tuchel doing it. He's got the pieces. He's got the midfielders. Uh, and if we, uh, if we look at this, Conte, I don't think he even subbed in. No, oh, he did. Okay. No, he, he subbed in 74th. It was late. He subbed in uh, Conte very late, but Conte didn't even start, which is super impressive in my opinion, you know, that, that he was able to, to get a result without Conte on the field. Uh, so props to Tuchel, props to Simeone. Very excited for that rematch. Uh, but that being said, let's move on to this next game that was on Tuesday. This one is, uh, is going to be pretty easy to talk about. This is Bayern Munich versus Lazio. The final score was 4-1, to one, with Bayern Munich having 56% and Lazio having 44. Shots were even with 14-13, to 13, Lazio having one more shot. Oh, man. This one, uh, <laughs> we, we knew this one was going to happen. Um, we Rudy, said, you want to yeah, sure. kick this one off? Kick this one off for us. Hey, we said call the cops, dude. They were called immediately at halftime because they got <laughs> ugly. It got ugly. And I'm yeah. I'm upset though, man. I said four nothing Bayern. I was one off. Thanks mm. Lazio for screwing it up. But man, I actually did get a chance to watch this, and man, I'm scared. Bayern just we, we talked about Bayern being a little off form as well before this game, uh, because I, I believe they dropped a match uh, domestically. Yep. But it's it's still Bayern, still the, the Bayern that we know. It's extremely scary how quick they are how everyone is always right place, right time, the awareness. Uh, everyone's always on the same page. Uh, and by the second, I would say maybe the third goal, it just lo- it looked like they were playing children. And, and I don't even mean that in a funny way. It's just that's the way they make people look. They, they seriously do. Lazio just look lost. And it got to the point where they didn't even they, – they just couldn't even get anything done. That fourth goal was actually an own goal. Um, yep. So – 
that just goes to show you where, you know, obviously own goals usually happen when you're trying to do a little too much and you're trying to get out of that, that rut that you're in, but they just couldn't even get out of their own half because Bayern just sat and played with them the whole time. It's, just, it's almost like they're just like toying with them, you know? Um, it's, 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 it's a scary team. It's a scary team. And I, I honestly, I think I got to pick them again to win this whole thing right now. And I know city looks great, but to me, the way Bayern look, I just think they have the better players in the in better positioning. Um, I really do. I, th- I think City, you know, we look at that billion dollar bankroll they have, but for me with City, it's it's maybe two to three players really that they couldn't live without. And I feel like Bayern could take their top two three players out and still be fine. So I could be wrong there, but. The way the way they're looking, I just I, I can't say no. I can't I can't say no. It's it's too dangerous. It's too dangerous. Um, and Flick, I mean, what, he's averaging a trophy every twenty games now. I think something like that. So <laughs> yeah. this, this is crazy. This is crazy. This, right. this is again. This is a man that took over, um, not even midway through last year. What by Christmas last year, and they've just soared. They've soared since right. then. Um, and then you know, looking at Lazio, like we said, all of us here on this pod today, we watch Syria. We've been watching Syria a long time. This is what Lazio do, unfortunately. And, and no offense to Lazio, but stage is a little bit too big for them. They're going to be going home soon. It's a shame that you, that they drew Bayern. Maybe they might, there might be another draw. If they had drawn somebody else, they might have a chance, but uh, they, I think this is, this is going to be a wrap. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, Joe, what is your, what was your thoughts on this game here? Bayern Munich uh, versus Lazio. Yeah, um, it was it was already going to be a tough game for Lazio. Um, we all know how strong and Bayern has been in the Champions League um, this season and the season before. Um, and now the scoreline that came out was a little bit. I I will still say it was very predictable. Um, Bayern Munich has already made them. Um, a decisive lead in the Champions League to, um, quarterfinals um, just with that results. That's how I feel at the moment. I don't think there is a way back for Lazio. Um, they are too strong for them. Um, they made a whole lot of errors. Um, and hey, um, it was actually great watching Musaccio um, <laughs> play for Lazio because um, I, I honestly wanted to watch him play. And then um, he made a couple of hours that led to um, Lewandowski's first goal. First goal. Um, there were too many hours from the um, Lazio backline. But then um, I don't think there was a way back for them. They lost possession too easily. It was just not their game. They lost the match for battle. Um, Bayern was just all over the place. And I don't think... Um, there's any way back for Lazio. Agreed. I would I would agree very much on all that. The back line made too many mistakes. The midfield was definitely at a disadvantage going up against Kimmich, Goretzka, Sané, Coman, and this new guy, Musiala, uh, yeah. who, I, who I've never heard of, but uh, he did a great job. And then you can't forget um, we can't forget about Joaquim Correa with a fantastic individual goal. That was uh, that was just spectacular the way he was able to dribble through that Bayern backline and and yeah. just score a goal out of nowhere. Uh, if I had to guess, I have a feeling he will not be at Lazio next year, just because he is he is a hot he is a hot prospect in Europe right now. But uh, just to piggyback on on what both of y'all have said. Bayern just dominated possession, took advantage of the uh, the mistakes that Lazio made, and and capitalized. And you know, credit to to Flick, uh, getting his team to to re motivate themselves for the Champions League. You know, as you said, Booty, their form in the domestic league right before this game was was pretty bad. They just lost to a a mid table team, and we were kind of we were kind of um, we were kind of suspect about their form going into this game, but. I mean, as soon as you tell Bayern Champions League, they flip a switch and they're they're out and the, they're out and uh, killing it as per usual. Uh, like you said, halftime the game was over. It was already three nil. Um, it's going to be a, a tough battle for Lazio. I don't see them coming back. This is 
you know, again, to piggyback what you're saying, Booty, this is the best team in Champions League right now. Um, I, I think Man City is definitely up there, but uh, Bayern looked the absolute best uh, going forward. So, I did to, to, to piggyback on uh, on what you yeah, said absolutely. one more time, uh-huh. uh, Musiala. And, and this is also piggybacking on what you're saying as far as the depth that they have. Musiala is 18 years old. Uh, so this was his first Champions League goal. He was called up from the U-17 squad for this match. So they're literally just picking players wow. where they want. He just turned 18 uh, this, this past this a uh, couple days ago, two days ago. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So Musiala turned how old? 18. 18. 18. Jeez, and he got a goal yeah. in Champions League. Yeah. They're not hurting. They're not hurting. Tell you Kids going places. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not forget they just signed Upa Meccano. Ah! Ah! <laughs> That's right. Ah! That's right. And, well, and you know, I guess that means Alaba is probably going to be out. His contract's up, and I believe they're not extending it. So he's going to be a free signing for somebody as well. So Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, I could see him going to Real Madrid or someone in the EPL, maybe Man U, Liverpool, maybe a Man City to re, uh, reconnect with Pep. Um, he is going to be a hot summer target, and uh, looking forward to see where he goes. You know who likes free signings? Juve. Oh, <laughs> we need a guy in the back. Speaking of which, y'all are desperate for a uh, center right. back right now. That's wow. right. That's right. That would be that would be clutch. Need dude. that. Need and that. I'm sure Pirlo would love to have Alaba on his team. I would take a body wow. right now. Just get a body to throw back there to help out. Somebody. Seriously. Seriously. Oh man. One more thing I want to point out for this game is that uh, Milinkovic Savic really. Uh, you can see he, he's kind of not motivated to be on Lazio. Uh, I have a feeling we will also – that's another player from Lazio that we will see move on. Uh, Joe, I don't know if you heard this, but there's rumors that Milan have put in an offer for Millie Savage. Have you heard this? Um, I'm yet to hear that, but then that would be a great signing. Um, he's a, um, a very good player. I will honestly love him to be part of our squad. Um I think Milan has been chasing him for quite some time. Yeah, we have. And now will still be good. Because he's still good. Um, I think he still have a lot in him to offer. And we need such a player in our midfield. Um, I know we have Benny and Cassie, but then hey, um, we are at, at, at the moment where Benny is not really playing too much down to injuries. So... Um, I don't know how the future looks like, but then if we can have him in our squad, it's pretty much going to be good. And I was hearing that um, um, rumors of um, Hakan going to Galatasaray. I think um, he liked the picture of, of Galatasaray on Instagram. He posted um, something about it. So I think he's actually confirming to the rumors. I don't know. But then if we can have him part of the Milan squad, I'll be very glad. Definitely. Definitely agree. Very well said. If he's going to be part of the Milan squad, he's also going to be guaranteed Champions League football at the moment. That's the league table stands. Hey, that's what he wants. I think he just wants Champions League football. And currently, Milan can give him that. Um, I would like to see Millie Savage more of like a 10-roll. I would let uh, Hakan Shalanoglu walk and put Millie Savage in that space and have Kessie and Ben Asser right behind him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think I think Millie Savage could easily fill in a number 10 role. And he kind of reminds me of like a Pogba in that he does have the abilities to play a 10, but he would also, I feel like, uh, want to drop back and play defense. So it would be very good for our midfield to have three players uh, that are defensive minded, but have the qualities to attack going forward. So, very well said. Let's uh, let's move on over to the Wednesday games. We've got Atalanta, Real Madrid, and Borussia Mönchengladbach versus Man City. Let's start off with Atalanta, Real Madrid. Booty, do you want to kick us off here? Oh, for show, sure, baby. Uh, so I actually oh. caught the second half of this one. Uh, so one nothing win by Real Madrid, but. Couple little things we got to point out about this one. So, 
Real Madrid going into this one missing nine players. Nine times. Nine players. <laughs> uh, so, some of those players that are missing, oh, I don't know, Sergio Ramos. Uh, you got any you can think of, Hugh? Rodrigo, I know, is one. Benzema. Benzema. Carvajal. Starters. Starters. Ha- Hazard. Yeah. yeah, Hazard was another one. They, uh, they, they were really missing some key players. But – You know who they weren't uh, missing. Yeah, Go ahead. You, you know where I'm going. Go ahead. They, kept, they still had Cruz, Casemiro, and Modric, which if you were going to tell me that I was going to be losing Ramos and Benzema, but I could keep Cruz, Casemiro, and Modric, I'd be like, eh, I'd be okay with that because everything runs through them. The whole uh, Real Madrid attack goes through them. Cruz is a, is a very good orchestrator. Modric is also a very good mo- uh, orchestrator. And then having Casemiro right behind you, he is a great defensive weapon in getting that ball back. And then he's got the capabilities to handle the pressure uh, while dribbling and then distribute it to either Cruz or Modric. One point you brought up before the pod is that uh, I got to give you credit for this. I did not know this. Casemiro got a yellow during this game, and he will not be able to play in the second leg, which is massive. He is, uh, he is a player that's always having to deal with an accumulation of yellows. Uh, especially for Brazil and, and cost them in big games. I remember in the 2018 World Cup, uh, Brazil was without Casemiro against Belgium, and it really was obvious. Um, De Bruyne ran all over Fernandinho during that game, and I don't think Casemiro would have allowed them, would have allowed De Bruyne or all that space. Uh, but that being said, uh, Joe, you wanna you wanna talk some more on this game? Uh, um... I feel like um, the red card um, to Atlanta actually changed everything about the game. And um, I still want to give my thumbs up to Gasparini and the way um, Atlanta is playing. Honestly, after the red card, I thought they were going to be um, outscored or probably um, concede a lot of goals, but then. I was actually surprised watching the game, you know, minute after minute, and they seemed to be playing so good and so brave. It only had to take almost like um, a spectacular from Fernand Mendy to break them down. And that was, it was, it had to be a super amazing strike because they look, they still look organized for almost like for 70 minutes. And then, hey, I was actually impressed with At- Atlanta. I still spend my my point. I still feel um, without my red card, it would have been a totally different game, and I think probably they would have they would have matched Madrid good for good. Um, but I was very really unfortunate the red card the red card came in too early, and then it changed everything. But then hey, the second leg they are still out to play for. I think Atlanta is totally not out. Look at how they played the first leg with just ten men. I still feel they have enough in their in their boots to um compete with Madrid um in Santiago Bernabeu. I I feel they are not out at all and then if they can really keep um their heads up, they can actually kick Madrid out. It's never far from rich. I don't think so. I would agree. I think Atalanta are definitely not out of this. Uh, this is very similar to the Atletico Madrid Chelsea situation, where it's just a one-zero game. It's one away goal for Real Madrid. They are totally in this booty. What are your thoughts on this game? Yeah, you know, I'm glad you said that. That was something I was gonna I was gonna bring up myself because Atalanta, as we know, can score goals, and the reason that they didn't score a lot this one was because of an early red card, uh, 17th minute red card uh, by midfielder uh, Fruller. So. It was it was questionable. Some say yes, some say no. Um, I, I think it's a little harsh just because of what time it was given, and it was given without thought. If you go back and look, the ref kind of just went straight to it. Um, Super quick. Some, yeah. Something I love and hate about footy, uh, the ref can change a game, and, and, and honestly, probably more so than any other sport. Uh, they And that immediately – that red immediately changed Atalanta's mindset going forward. You know, Atalanta always goes – Goes heavy, throwing guys forward, three man back. Well, that all had to change once they lost the man, of course. So 
imagine, you know, you have this game plan, you have guys that can score, and then all of a sudden, 17 minutes in, you got to look at other options. Uh, and that's what yeah. Gasparini had to do, unfortunately. And the other part of this that just ended up being extremely shitty for Atalanta was that midfield that we're speaking of now has – or the, re, the midfield we're speaking of for Real Madrid – now has even more space to work with more moving forward. Um, they're going to have more possession, more opportunities. And if you let Modric and Cruz and Casemiro play around with the ball in your half, it's going to be really, really scary. So even though Real Madrid did win this one at 86 minute goals, beautiful by Mendy uh, mm. in a way, I really feel like this was still a win for Atalanta because towards the end, they were really playing for that draw. Hey, you didn't get the draw, but at least Real Madrid didn't run rampant on you, and they get two, three goals. This is very doable. It's very doable, and this will be going to Atalanta, I believe. Or, or no, this is going to Berenbau, isn't it? Correct. Yeah. So that's well said. You know, uh, not out. Atalanta is definitely not out, and uh, I, I didn't. I failed to mention the the stats in this game: sixty nine percent possession to thirty one. And Real Madrid had 19 shots to Atalanta's two. So you can only imagine that as soon as that red card happened, Gasparini said, okay, let's salvage as much as we can from this game and just try and weather the storm. And credit to Gasparini and Atalanta, keeping it 0-0 all the way until the 86th minute. Yeah, That in itself is super impressive. They did lose the game, but the fact that they kept it 0-0 down 10 men, uh, let's say the card was in the 16th minute, it's in the 17th, but to make the, the math easy, they played 10 on 11 for 70 minutes and kept no goals, and it wasn't until the last four minutes of the, the second half that they let in a goal, and what a goal it was. There's not much you can really do with a goal like that. It was just a an absolutely incredible individual play by Mendy. Um I, I agree with both of y'all. Atalanta is definitely not out of this game, especially with the way they attack. Gasparini, as you said, Joe, uh, really just put on a, a great showing here. And uh, I, I'm really looking forward to this rematch going in back to Bernabeu. And you know, uh, you know something else too, man, that's, that's, that's really interesting and impressive by Gasparini too. You know, with Real Madrid missing nine guys, they, they kind of had, other than the midfield, you, you really had no clue what you are going to get, you know? It, w- it wasn't like you could go to the film room and, and turn on uh, a Real Madrid game and go back and look and see, okay, maybe maybe this is what we're going to see. You know, there there wasn't that. Missing nine guys uh, and, and props to, to Zidane for actually figuring out something to throw out there. Kind of threw Isco in kind of like a false nine to help with that midfield a little bit too. So that, that was impressive in itself. But it, I'm even more impressed, like you said, Atalanta to play almost, you know, 70 minutes – uh, down a man, and you had no clue what you were going to get going in this game from a world class team and a world class coach. Uh, that's that's a win for me. I take that. Definitely, definitely. Joe, do you have uh, any final points you want to add to this? Yeah. Um, now looking at um the second leg fixture between um Madrid and Atlanta. There is no doubt Atlanta has to has to score, and that's the bottom line. And I feel um, even though that red card changed the dynamic of the game and handed Madrid over a massive advantage, um, the same thing can happen in Madrid, where um, probably um, At- Atlanta can um, try as much as possible and probably get an early goal so that the dynamics of the game might also change as well. Um, I still fancy them to qualify out from, out from this um, um, this first chat. I will stick my neck out for Atlanta. I've watched them. I've seen the way they play. I know Madrid is, is, is very solid. They have a very solid midfield and they are very experienced. Um, with Tony Cruz, Luka Modric, Casemiro, um, they have played together for a long time, and they will still um, push much threat to Atlanta. But then, just looking at the Atlanta forward, I think scoring in Bernabeu wouldn't be a problem if they can only um, um, play like they have been playing um, all season round, and how 
they even played in this in the first leg. Um, how composed they were and all that. I, mean, I still feel they can score a goal and make things very hard for Madrid. One goal, there's not really any scoreline to not to overturn for Atlanta. I still feel they can they can give us a show. Definitely, definitely agree with you, Joe. Yeah, definitely agree. Everything you said, spot on. Very, very much. Um, this tie is still very much alive. Nothing to, to worry about, especially if you're Gasparini. The dude is just like a mad scientist as a coach. He, he just, he makes it work with the players he has. And it's funny, if, I'm sure if you were to compare the budget of Atalanta versus Real Madrid, you would just be ac- absolutely in shock at the difference in money, yet the quality and the play style still somehow manage to meet uh, at this level of Champions League. It's, it's really remarkable to see how uh, you know, a soccer game can have a, one team that's worth a billion dollars and another team that's worth maybe a couple hundred million, and still the game finishes one to nil. Um, so props to Atalanta. Uh, Real Madrid definitely escaped with a lucky win. Uh, Let's let's move on over to the last game on Wednesday. This game is Borussia Mönchengladbach versus Man City. Uh, Pep Guardiola's squad was able to pull out a 2-0 win uh, with 60% possession to 40%. Uh, Man City also had nine shots to three. Joe, I'm going to pass it off to you. What were your thoughts on this game? Um, it was pretty much um, predictable as well. Um, Man City... Is really in a great form. They're playing so well in the Premier League. And then um, this fixture, um, just after the draw, um, it was it was much more um, decisive already. Everybody was, was starting um, City to actually um, qualify with ease. And, and it looks like that's what is going to happen. Um, Butcher and Team Blackback, I don't think they have in, um, enough in them to actually kick City out. Guardiola and City is in superb form. Um, they are winning almost every game, both in the Champions League and the league. I don't think there is a way out for much Blackback. Definitely agree. This is going to be uh, another game where it looks like this one's pretty much in the bag, kind of like Lazio, Bayern, uh, Borussia Mönchengladbach. Uh, just doesn't. Uh, I don't know. I don't, we'll have to see. I'm. I'm just not convinced. Booty, what are your thoughts on this game? Yeah, as we mentioned, you know, it's it's hard not to get caught up and carried away with a first leg result, but yes. with this one, right. I'm caught up and I'm carried away and I'm done. Um, from from what I saw, first of all, sixty percent possession is great. Not as great as the sixty nine percent that Real had. Mm, I love sixty nines, mm. but sixty nine percent anyway. So, <laughs> Munch and Gladbach, they were much and much. Um, I'm gonna tell you this: <laughs> if we had saw, if we were to see the Gladbach we've seen up to this point go up against City, I think they would have a shot next leg. But the fact that City if you had watched this game, they just – and Ocho and I mentioned this. We were talking the other day. They just they were able to just take Gladbach out of their element and turn them into a team that is not Gladbach. Um, it's funny because City and Gladbach, to me, the way they score goals and the way that they press, they almost kind of seem like that same team. But City was able to take that possession, and if you're going to take the ball away from a team that likes to score, they're lost. They're in the woods, they're by themselves, and the Bears are coming to, to, to take you away and eat you. So uh, the Bears came and eat. So I got to say, I think we're going to see more of this. Uh, quick point, De Bruyne didn't even play. He subbed in. He subbed in, yeah, excuse me, yeah, you're right. No, nope, I'm wrong. I'm totally wrong. Forget that. You were absolutely right. He did not even play. He did not even and see, play. I was, thinking, I, him... I was thinking he got in late, so go ahead. No, he, he subbed in late for Arsenal. Uh, that's what I remember. But uh, as far as this game, he didn't even play. Yeah, that's the best. I would say that's the best player on Man City is Kevin De Bruyne, and he didn't even play. Agree. I mean, uh, if you're if you're Gladbach, you're like, oh man, you're yeah. already up two zero, and we didn't even see De Bruyne on the field. <laughs> didn't even see De Bruyne, and you you see him in the warm ups chilling on the bench. I'm sure they're like, oh, perfect. Yeah, something weird. I thought 
for Gladbach, you know, I, I don't know if there's more to this than we know. Um, Marcus Therome, who's been great for Gladbach all tournament, uh, was not starting in this one. He came on, I believe he came in second half when they were in trouble. Uh, that, for me, is a guy that's got to be out there. Man City, it's Champions League. If he's good to go, I, I think he's got to start. So I don't, I don't understand. Um, that's a guy that could possibly get you some of those goals and has been getting you some of those goals. But but then again, if you're taking out of your element the way they were, they look like a completely different team. And just as Gunnar Joe just said, clearly not going to have enough to stand up to, to City. And at the end of the day, I think Bayern is going to be the only one to stand up to this team. Agreed. A uh, couple of points I want to add in here. Uh, one thing, Booty, one thing you pointed out a couple episodes ago, Marco Rose or Rose of Borussia Mönchengladbach actually is going to be the Borussia Dortmund coach for next season. Is that That's correct, right? Yeah, I believe he was in contract talks with them and it was agreed, yep. So that's something interesting here because Borussia Mönchengladbach's coach is, is already gone next season. So uh, you, you have to wonder if that kind of puts a psychological uh, – kind of twist dip, yeah. on the players and the coach thinking, well, this guy's with us now, but he's already thinking about next season. Um, if I was a player, that would be definitely something in the back of my mind. Not to mention if I'm the manager, that's something in the back of my mind. You know, I'm, I'm coaching this team right now in Champions League, but I know I'm going to have Holland and Dortmund next season. So, right. um, I, you know, how much effort are you going to put in this season knowing you're not going to be there next season? I don't know. It, I don't know what kind of personality this guy has. So that's something interesting going forward with this game. Uh, one more thing I got to point out is when we look at the heat maps and the player positions for Man City, uh, they did a phenomenal job maintaining possession uh, at midfield and even further into midfield. And what they wound up doing was pushing Gladbach back into their own half, uh, forcing them to, to do quick counters. Uh, Man City was giving them the space to counter, and uh, and Gladbach fell right into that trap. Gladbach are not a counter-attacking team. They very much like to have ball possession. And uh, Booty, I believe you said this just to piggyback onto it again, uh, Man City forced Gladbach into a style of play that they're not comfortable with. And not to mention, if you were going to be doing a counter-style play, Taram is the perfect player to have as your striker. Yeah. Why not put him on the field if you're going to be countering and let him just run with the horses? I, uh, I'm i really confused as well as to why Taram. I think there's something we're missing there. But uh, shout out to Pep. We thought he was going to overthink this one. And, um, you know, his his crazy tactical plan worked here. Joel Cancelo wound up playing more as like a center defensive mid. Uh, if you look at his average player position, it's it's almost as if he is a CDM, which is it's really interesting to see that uh, kind of play out. And then a lot of their attack would go down the wings, and then they channel it back through the middle. Majority of their shots being right at the top of the box. Uh, this is just a on par uh, tactical masterclass by Pep against uh, a German team. Well done, Pep. Uh, well done, Champions League. This was a, a phenomenal. Uh, actually, Joe, sorry, I, I kind of breezed by. Do you have any extra thoughts you want to add on Man City, Gladbach? Um, City, um, at the moment, is, is playing very well, um, just like I said earlier. Um, right. You you look at um, how possessive um, they are during games, and in general, their performance is very good. They look to control the game, you know, they don't really um, like to defend, so they like to set the pace. And then um, they have to have you um, running, um, which I feel um, Munchen Blackback um, was very good on the day, um, trying to um, um, defend a little bit. But then the quality with City was just too much. Is the reason why I, I can't really fault um, Gladbach to, um, 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 a lot. Because the quality in the city is very much, and even though De Bruyne is not playing, you have Bernardo Silva, you have Sterling, and then the Manchester dominance is just a lot. So it's just not going to be their game. Um, they should hold their heads up high. Um, I still feel um, they should um, rather build on their experience with 
this kind of matches and then this season's Champions League, there is no way they are going to get back into the second leg um, back in back in England. I feel it's over for them, but then they should build on from here. They should learn a lot from this stage and then um, they can take it into the next season. That's if they can make it out again and qualify. Yeah, very, uh, very well said. Booty, we can't forget about this. You and I talked about this. Who is who is one of the best players for Man City uh, in that game? Big Dong Phil. Phil Foden. Big Dong Phil Foden. Like a go with that, Philly. Tell you Man, what. talk about uh, an up-and-coming player. We saw Mbappe and Holland really jump on the scene this first leg. Phil Foden is right up there in the conversation as far as the, the next up-and-coming young star. He looked fantastic this game. Didn't get on the score sheet, uh, didn't produce any assists, but as far as what he did when he was on the ball, very, very attack-minded player, very smart in the space as far as uh, what he does with the ball. Very excited to see what he can offer Man City uh, in the future. He's great at keeping possession. Yeah, very great really at possession, and then he when he draws his defenders in, he always seems to find the right pass, and he always has that mentality of he knows where to go. It's almost yeah. like a uh, Queen's Gambit. This guy knows four moves ahead of time where somebody's going to be. And it's so weird to me because that's a guy like about a year and a half ago I'd make fun of every time he's in the lineup, you know. And now look at him. I, mean, I deserve yeah. to make fun of now. So big dong Phil, big dong Phil, dude. Props, big, props that, dude. That'll be his nickname going forward. King's for Gambit. We we'll call him King's Gambit or Big Dong King's Phil. King's Gambit. He's, nice. He knows where everything's going. Four moves ahead. It really does, and uh, I believe Pep even said in a uh, interview that Phil Foden is priceless. They will never sell Phil uh, at Man City ever. So that's going to be really cool to see Phil. Phil's probably going to stay there for the next ten years uh, and get a really fat contract uh, at that. So. <laughs> uh, congrats <laughs> congrats to Man City uh, Booty why don't you uh, close us out here or should we go through the schedule for the up and coming fixtures yeah, what, let's, do you, what do you think what we got, what we got next All right, the next time that we'll be champions leaguing will be on March 9th Juve FC Porto time to turn around guys and we also have same day Dortmund Sevilla that one's going to be a fun one Dortmund up 3-2 to two right now that's plenty of room for error there, so that'd be pretty fun. Uh, then on the Wednesday, March tenth, we got Liverpool and Leipzig. Another one, two nothing. Liverpool's up, but two nothing. That's plenty of room for error as well. We know Leipzig can press and score goals, and Liverpool more injuries since the last game uh, with right. Anderson out. So that'll be interesting. Uh, and then same day we got PSG and Barcelona. Night night Barcelona. It's been fun. Actually, it hasn't. Just go to sleep. <laughs> yes, very much uh, agree with you there. Barcelona are uh, are pretty much dead and done. They're just looking for that last nail in the coffin. Uh, very excited to see uh, a lot of these games here. Juve Porto, very much still alive. Dortmund Sevilla, very much still alive. Liverpool Leipzig, very much still alive. PSG Barcelona, ah. are we going to see that same kind of result we saw that last time these two came to uh, came to play each other? Unlikely, but you never know. Um, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and close out this episode. We're having some audio issues here. Joe, you know the rules. We always like to give a shout-out to uh, someone on the podcast uh, before we end this episode. Who is your shout-out for this episode? Um, to Abby, that's, that's the friend that um, talked to you earlier, you know. A big shout-out yeah. to you. He's, he's really been a part of my life as well, so... Um, I'll take the opportunity to say hi to him over on the show and then um, to the whole family, the Osage 2 family, the Grace Life group. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for all you guys being in my life and all. And then um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll say hi to you and Buddy as well. It's been a long time. And then hearing from you guys again um, is actually superb. I'm very happy with that. Awesome. Love that shout out. Uh, definitely. If, if Robbie is close by, feel free to bring him on over. Tell him to say hello on the podcast. Uh, if he's not close by, no worries. We'll, uh, we'll catch him on another episode. He's very close. He's very close. Actually, can hear you speak. So 
Um, you would like to say something before um, we end everything? Yeah, definitely. Tell them to get on the microphone. Say uh, hello to our guests and our listeners. I'm back on the show. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is Robbie, also from Ghana, huge Real Madrid fan. Uh, Robbie, say hello to all of our listeners out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to say hello to every Madrid fan out there and say, yeah, we are going through a lot of um, um, difficult situation right now with all these injuries and all. But yeah, we still rise up. Yeah, hala Madrid, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> very nice, very nice. Glad to have you on the show, uh, Robbie. Appreciate the uh, appreciate you jumping in there, saying hello. Uh, Ala Madrid. I'm also a Madrid fan. Don't tell Joe that though. Joe might uh, might not be friends with me after he finds out I'm I'm actually a pretty big Madrid fan. <laughs> Thank you, Robbie. We're gonna pass this over to Booty. Booty, who is your shout out for today? Man, uh, I'm gonna keep it simple today. Uh, I'm gonna go uh, shout out to my wife, uh, Kimberly. Uh, we actually just found out we'll, we got we got a little booty in the oven. So whoa. Yeah, so. <laughs> Uh, Congratulations, brother! It's, a, it's the second time she's had a booty inside of her, and now <laughs> this one, this one I think is going to be a lot better than the first one. But uh, oh my god! But uh, awesome. but yes. So uh, shout out to her because she's been she's been feeling super super sick and shitty. Uh, first trimester is not very nice to her at all. So uh, I've I've felt really bad because there's not really much I can do. Yeah. Um, other than just if she literally just yells anything, I go do it. Um, food is very nasty to her right now. Like she can barely eat mm. things. So we have like windows of opportunity where she's like, that sounds like I could eat that. And I'm just like, hop in the car and go like, I feel like I could eat Chick-fil-A waffle fries right now on the way. <laughs> <laughs> anything you want. Yep. Hey, dearie. <laughs> yep. Like she, she's hanging with her friends right now. And it's the first time she's like, felt okay to like go do something oh. so i was like go go do something um and she's like yeah let's let's hang out later because we haven't so uh, props props to her she's about to go through a lot of shit that uh i'm glad i never have to go through but she's strong enough to do it so um certainly she's she'll definitely be fine and um really excited yeah great shout out to booty's wife shout out to the the little booty in the oven very uh very excited to see uh, how all that goes in the future, and uh, wish your your wife and the uh, future child lots of health, man. This is exciting times for the Wells Booty family. Love that. Hopefully she can. Uh, hopefully it's a it's a girl, so we can win a World Cup. <laughs> hey, man, that's awesome. Love that. Uh, for my shout out, uh, don't really have one in mind. Let's see. I had one last night. Uh, you know what? I'm gonna go shout out to the Pels. Shout out to the New Orleans Pelicans. They are managing to uh, to, to kind of get on a roll uh, this time of year in New Orleans. Uh, it's basketball season. The NFL has stopped, and the city kind of shifts its focus to our NBA team. And you know, unfortunately, because of COVID, we can't fill the arena, so uh, a lot of people are at home watching the game. But the uh, the Bayou Boys uh, on the Pelicans are, are managing to get it done. I just saw them beat the the Celtics the other night. That was a really great win. Celtics are a great team. So shout out to the Pel. Shout out to Zion. Shout out to uh, uh, Mello. Is that his last name? What's his last name? Lonzo. Lonzo. Shout out to Lonzo Ball. Shout out to Brandon Ingram. Uh, and shout out to our new coach, um, Stan Van Gundy, I believe his name. Ron Jeremy, yeah. Yeah, Ron Jeremy, a.k.a. Ron Jeremy. Uh, so that is my shout out for today. Booty, thank you for being on as always. Love having you as a co host. Joe, appreciate you coming all the way from Ghana. I'm not sure if Joe's there anymore. But anyway, this is the Footy Fetish Show, where the fetish is real and the footy is soccer. Peace out, Boy Scouts. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs>